All right. Um, <clears throat> hello, and a very warm welcome to our session on moving towards an inclusive history of science communication. We are delighted to have all of you with us today, and we look forward to actively engaging with you during the course of this session. My name is Siddharth Tankarya. I'm a brown, partially disabled, cisgendered man from India. I have short black hair, I'm wearing a chocolate brown colored shirt today, and I have my office working space in the background. I work as a science communication practitioner and researcher at the National Center for Biological Sciences in the city of Bangalore in India, and I'm interested in developing intersectional science engagement practices for the Global South. I would now like to invite all our panelists to introduce and describe themselves briefly. Uh, can we begin with Amelia, please? Uh, yes, hello everyone. My name is Amelia Bonia, and I'm a research fellow at the Heidelberg Center for Transcultural Studies at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, I'm from Romania. I have long hair and I'm wearing a, a black cardigan. Um, I'm a historian of South Asia and the British Empire and uh, work primarily at the intersections of uh, media, science, technology and medicine. And I'm here, I think, because I've conducted some uh, research on the history of science communication. Uh, and I have also been involved in a number of public engagement projects around science, technology and medicine uh, in India, Britain and Germany. I'm looking forward to interacting with you all. Uh, can we have Elizabeth next? Hello, everyone. Uh, it feels strange trying to uh, do something like this at this time of the night, my time. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here. And Sidat uh, uh, has done a fantastic job as the convener for this session. And uh, I hope that uh, we live up to his uh, very high expectations. Uh, my background is in engineering and industry, uh, but I realized that it was very important for people like me to come into the public innovation space to drive uh, transformation and development in terms of science communication and STEM education. So that really has been uh, what I do for, for my sins or love and fresh air over the last uh, 20 odd years. Uh, apart from my normal job. And it's been an incredible journey. It's been challenging. It's been inspiring. And along the way, I have been motivated and uh, really encouraged by so many um, peers and uh, seniors who have mentored me along the way. So I'm looking forward to our discussions today as we peel off yet another layer in the onion that I describe as a yeah, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The, the layer we're looking at today is that of the uh, globally inclusive history of science communication, uh, just to show us that our work is never done. When we talk about inclusion, we have to keep peeling the layers. And the more layers we peel, guess what? We find that there's more and we have to keep going. So today's conversation, is about yet another layer that we have to work as a field to address. So welcome to this conversation. Thank you. Uh, can I now invite Paige to also introduce herself? Hi, I am Paige Jaro. Um, I am a white woman. Right now I have a very short blonde hair um, and I'm in my office uh, in Louisiana as a background. I am a science communicator, um, scientist by background turned science communicator and storyteller. I currently work at Lifeomic as VP of science communication there, where I co-founded Lifeology, um, which you might have seen our Lifeology course on the history of science communication um, that we'll be talking about a little bit in this session. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about that today. I'm very passionate about the science of science communication and helping practitioners learn about the evidence of what works in science communication um, and also um, teaching scientists to communicate better with the public. Last but not the least, uh, can we have Argya? Uh, you're muted, Argya. Now, can you hear me? Is it okay now? Yeah. Oh, yes. So my name is uh, Argya Manna. 
Uh, I am an artist and illustrator from India. Uh, I uh, love to tell stories from science and history of science uh, through art. Uh, I actually am studying history of science through the lens of an artist. I love to collaborate with scientists and historians all over, all around the globe, and uh, also practicing comics art, sequential art to tell visual stories. Uh, I am here to uh, I am here today to discuss uh, role of art and visual communication in, through the course of history and science communication. So welcome everyone in forward to this discussion. Right. So I'm going to take a moment to just introduce our session. So as practitioners, researchers and teachers of science communication in one form or the other, we've all dealt with the lack of diversity and equity in science. <laughs> we, as a community of practice, spent enough time reflecting on the biases within PSYCOM itself. Our session today hopes to build a conversation around the need for acknowledging, understanding and moving towards a more inclusive history of science communication. We will begin by providing an introduction to historically diverse ways of exchanging knowledge, discuss how approaches like visual storytelling and historical studies of science can help us make our psycho more inclusive, and finally highlight the importance of engaging with a more global history of science communication moving forward. Our session will begin with short presentations by all the panelists for the first half an hour, and then move towards an open-ended panel discussion for the next 45 minutes. We encourage everyone to submit their questions uh, through the chat box at the bottom of their screens. Uh, we will try our best to address all your questions during the panel discussion. Uh, a gentle reminder also that this session is being recorded and you can choose to keep your cameras turned off if required. Uh, we would also request you to kindly keep yourself muted unless called upon to speak. In case you need to communicate with us about anything else, please feel free to use the chat box feature. And thank you so much for your cooperation. Now, can I invite Paige to sort of begin her presentation? Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. Um, hopefully everyone can see these uh, slides and I can also describe them um, if you can't see them, but I'm just gonna give a short presentation about Lifeology, which was the platform that we used to create our short flashcard course about an inclusive history of science communication. Um, so I am the VP of science communication at Lifeomic and I'm the co-founder of Lifeology, which is a platform that helps bring scientists and artists together to make science and health information more um, accessible uh, through art. So um, on this slide, we have a wonderful illustration that was created for one of our Lifeology courses um, by Jessica Razor and, and or by Anna Doherty, sorry. And it shows um, the storyboarding process that we go through in creating Lifeology courses. So it's very much like creating a comic book or something like that um, in that they we combine science and art by um, storyboarding out text-based courses. So some just key elements of Lifeology that I wanted to point out that has helped in creating uh, the course that we have for you to look at um, that talks about a brief but inclusive history of science communication is that Lifeology is all about combining science and art through technology, but also through collaboration. So at its core, at the technology, um, on the technology side, Lifeology is a, um, is a platform for creating mobile friendly bite-sized education in the form of these um, flash, we call them flashcard courses. Um, they look like little flashcards on a mobile phone or kind of an ebook on a, on a desktop screen that you can swipe through or go through kind of looks like a kid's storybook in a way that combines um, the same real estate of art and text on the card with little bite-sized amount of text. Um, so it helps to make science and health information more accessible, kind of we take out jargon, we try to make it very succinct um, and easy to follow in the form of stories. But the other pieces of Lifeology that are really critical is collaboration. So every course is a collaboration between artists, scientists, and storytellers. We also bring in reviewers, whether they be audience reviewers, reviewers for cultural elements or fact checkers. And then we also bring in translators oftentimes to make sure that we're translating things, not just through text, but also in the art. Um, and this collaboration is the key to the mythology process of creating more accessible science communication. And the other component of that is a diverse community. So we've worked really hard to create a global network of artists and storytellers that are from all over the world. And we try very hard to bring different people together in creating lifeology courses such that there are diverse perspectives represented. Um, and we think that helps to make the science communication that we're doing more inclusive um, by bringing 
diverse people together and collaborating to create this content. So that's just a little overview of lifeology and I'll kick it off to the rest of our presentation now. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful overview of the Lifeology platform page and for introducing us to our course on the inclusive history of science communication. Can I quickly check if my slide is visible uh, on the screen? Yep. All right, great. So let me give you a brief overview of some of the things that Paige, uh, in the course uh, that Paige mentioned uh, and be covered in that. Mm, sorry about this. Right. So my name is Siddharth, as I mentioned, and I'm going to be talking to you about uh, our course, which is which was on the inclusive history of science communication. So often when we think about the history of science communication, one of the first things that come to mind are the various public scientific controversies like the mad, cows, uh, mad cow disease outbreak, the controversial rise of GM crops, or the debate around nanotechnology. All of these controversies in the last few decades have played a very important role in bringing the theory and practice of science communication into sharp focus. These controversies have often exposed, uh, exposed flaws in how we think about science communication, the frameworks we use to describe best practices in the field, and of course, the way we teach science communication today. Therefore, it is not surprising that the development of the deficit dialogue and participation models in science communication have all been shaped and influenced by such controversies in one way or the other. The particular framing of scientific controversies pushing the field of science communication forward makes for an excellent narrative for teaching science communication in universities. But it also begs the question of whether the field of science communication actually began as a result of these controversies, or was it actually much older than that? To answer this question, let us look at some of the biases inherent within the sanitized and structured history of science communication. So let me begin with my own example. As someone who is formally trained in SciCom in the UK and has been working in India as a SciCom practitioner and researcher for the last six years, I've come across a fair share of SciCom teaching and training resources myself. But it, is, it has always striked me that most modern accounts of science communication refer to examples, case studies, and approaches used by people from Western Europe and North America are predominantly focused around English speaking cultures and are almost always, uh, and almost always make use of cisgendered and heteronormative contexts for their use. Further, having worked both in the UK and in India, I also constantly feel a disconnect between the SICOM approaches so elegantly employed in the global north and the realities of implementing these within global south context. There's always a disconnect between these two things. So what exactly are we missing out on? Is the history of science communication really so geographically isolated and recent in time? Personally, I would like to make the case that this history of science communication dates back much further and includes many interesting examples, practices, actors, and approaches going back to thousands of years. A wide variety of cultures have been engaging in systematic ways of knowing and understanding the world for many centuries now. They've also been sharing their knowledge for just as long by using a splendid array of science, images, and words. These examples from the Global South have also been applying insights and approaches that the Global North has only recently started to advocate for. For example, many indigenous knowledge sharing practices are focused around building a sense of community, fostering dialogue and participation, and often use a diversity of creative approaches for engaging audiences effectively. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, the Aboriginal communities in Australia have been using oral storytelling traditions for tens of thousands of years to pass, on, to pass on knowledge about agriculture, tool making, geology, astronomy, and even natural disasters. It is very interesting to note how the production and sharing of such knowledge forms were intricately linked to each other, how such knowledge systems were a product of keenly observing their surroundings, and why having such knowledge systems deeply rooted within people's own life experiences made it much more easier to understand, remember, and share such knowledge. Similarly, there is an incredible diversity of traditions and approaches for communicating science from all across the world. And there is great value in studying and learning from such multicultural and diverse histories of science communication. Take for instance, the griots of Western Africa, who were folk singers, storytellers, and historians that also contributed to health communication efforts during the Ebola, Ebola crisis. These griots 
artists were able to use a rich mix of indigenous context, stories, and music in developing the health communication outputs. This is a great example, in my opinion, of locally embedded practitioners symbiotically combining Western scientific knowledge with indigenous cultures and traditional practices. And there is so much, much more that we can learn from these multicultural practices. Now, there's also something to be said about rethinking inclusive science communication, right? We, we, have all, we can all agree that we need a lot more dialogue, reflections, and actionable solutions to even begin moving towards a more inclusive history of science communication in terms of its practice, research, but most importantly, its teaching. At the same time, we must also not forget that we need to be careful about not hijacking and appropriating these traditions and cultural practices as newly discovered forms of science communication without actually seeking proper permissions and participation from these local communities that have first uh, you know, uh, pioneered these, uh, these science communication practices. It would actually be much better if we created spaces for all kinds of science practices to thrive and allowed cultures and individuals to adopt the term science communication for themselves. History shows us that there is a wide diversity of approaches across the globe for making scientific knowledge more inclusive, accessible, and relevant. Ultimately, the most important forms, the most impactful forms of science communication throughout history have involved communicators who listened empathetically to their audiences, built meaningful relationships, trust, and a sense of community, but most importantly, enabled their stakeholders with a sense of agency and ownership in engaging with knowledge systems. Our session today is a small attempt to expand upon a Eurocentric, Anglophone, and heteronormative history of science communication by incorporating narratives, examples, and anecdotes of knowledge sharing practices from across time, continents, and cultures. We hope you would join us in this wonderful journey and contribute your own examples and experiences too. Thank you so much. And now can I call upon Amelia to deliver her presentation? Thank you, Siddharth. So um, I'm going to illustrate some of the points Siddharth has made about the importance of incorporating historical perspectives into science communication practices with um, examples from my own work as a historian of media and uh, science. Um, to begin with uh, the conclusion, the message I would like to convey is that um, investigating the past uh, helps illuminate how many of the uh, ingrained structural inequalities that plague both contemporary science and science communication uh, can be traced back to systems of exclusion and discrimination, which um, in the particular case I am discussing, that of South Asia, were put into place in the context of the British Empire. So reckoning with this longer history of inequality and underrepresentation um, is an important <coughs> step towards uh, decolonizing and diversifying not only science and science communication, but also histories of science and knowledge making more generally. Um, so the first example I have uh, comes from research I uh, conducted on scientific periodicals uh, and the newspaper press, uh, more specifically the reporting of the third plague pandemic that began in the um, 1850s uh, and severely affected several parts of India uh, by the end of the 19th century. Uh, so during that period, the newspaper and periodical uh, press was central to the circulation of scientific knowledge claims, which means that they played an important role in processes of uh, science and knowledge communication. And I identified uh, interesting parallels with the contemporary scenario, for example, in the way in which um, vaccine trials were introduced to the public. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on the voluntary nature of vaccination campaign, in, campaigns in India, um, and the uh, health authorities drew on the power of statistics to establish the efficacy of the plague vaccine, for example, by showing that um, the mortality rate was lower among those that had been uh, vaccinated. But on the other hand, um, again, not unlike uh, nowadays, um, epidemics uh, also provided countless opportunities for stigmatization and helped to reinforce older uh, racial and ethnic stereotypes. And this was reflected in uh, uh, the media coverage. We have uh, here a letter published in a, a Calcutta newspaper from 1898, which made a case for European immunity from the plague. Uh, on account of factors such as constitution and cleanliness, uh, but conveniently discounted uh, as irrelevant the socioeconomic background of Europeans in India, in particular the fact that they benefited from better nutrition or living facilities. And um, in the pages of the uh, very famous uh, British medical journal, The Lancet, it still exists today, reporting about the outbreak of the plague in Hong Kong uh, became an opportunity to remind readers that many of the Chinese houses were so filthy that they were unfit for human habitation. And I'm sure we can find here parallels with what is uh, happening uh, uh, today with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the next slide, please see that. 
Um, so the printed press um, played an important role in uh, science communication in the 19th century, but this was not the only way in which knowledge was uh, disseminated or popularized, uh, especially considering the fact that a large section of the population uh, in India was not literary or could not access such publication. There were also a lot of um, public experiments and lecturing, uh, for example, at fairs, uh, market sites or places of religious significance. And in this slide, you can see a, a man called uh, Ruchi Ramsani, who in the late 19th century delivered many public lectures on topics like uh, chemistry, uh, physics, and uh, meteorology. Uh, some of them at venues uh, such as shops and uh, Sikh temples, uh, others at um, Science Institute, which he established uh, for the purpose of popularizing uh, science in uh, the province of Punjab. And these lectures were delivered in both English and vernacular languages, and his memoirs indicate that it was a mutually instructive process with the audience occasionally contributing suggestions for the translation of Western scientific vocabulary into the vernacular. Uh, he also made use of visual aids such as charts and self-made lantern slides uh, because these were not easily available um, in India, especially in Punjab. Uh, and this brings me to the last point of my uh, talk, if we could change again the slide, uh, namely the connection between gender and uh, the visual culture of science popularization. As you have seen from the example of Ruchi Ramsani, he was very keen on using, using visual aids in public lectures. Uh, but the situation was slightly different with regards to printed publications. And this was particularly the case in Victorian Britain, where men usually shied away from using illustrations, which were believed to have an adverse effect on the mental faculties of the audience. Uh, so the last example I have here is that of the Scottish naturalist uh, Eliza Brightman, whose book uh, Rambles with Nature Students was, as you can see uh, here, prolifically illustrated. So in other words, um, in the British context, at least, many of those who took advantage of the developing mass visual culture to popularize and disseminate science in the 19th century were women. And I think this is an aspect that we don't often discuss. Um, so of course, the gender dimension worked differently in a historical context like that of South Asia, where we don't have many such publications to begin with. Uh, but I think I'll stop here uh, because uh, our guest presentation is going to engage exactly with this uh, visual uh, culture of knowledge making and uh, science communication. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. If you. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, hello, everyone. So um, basically, uh, thank you, uh, Siddharth and Amelia, for their extensive discussion on uh, different aspects of the history of science. Uh, what I will be talking to be about is basically the extension of what Siddharth uh, showed you. Uh, he, um, uh, Siddharth basically uh, showed uh, slides from the course we together developed, and he visually mentioned the uh, requirement of embracing the art from the Aboriginal Australian and the different uh, types of storytelling like uh, songs from the guy from Western Africa. Uh, so I, in my talk, I'll add some specific example with, uh, as an extension, and I'll bring discussions on what Siddharth told about knowledge and also Amelia told uh, about that. So the, my topic is embracing indigenous botanical art from India, and I hope uh, that will be uh, help us a bit to understand the role of visual storytelling in and decolonizing history of science communication. Uh, next slide. Yeah, uh, can, can you move to the next slide? Yeah, then, thank you. So, <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, like many other aspects of history of science, uh, much attention has been paid to the role of European art in science communication through the course of history. Uh, uh, no, the, uh, please show the first slide, the previous one, actually. Yeah, uh, No, the first slide. The, the first slide. Yeah, uh, this one. So uh, we, 
Okay, so uh, I was talking that uh, like many other aspects of history of science, much attention has been paid to the role of European art or image in science communication. Uh, but uh, but uh, we need to uh, discuss that uh, how the image uh, became a tool of science communication through the course of history. Next slide. Okay, so the uh, thing is uh, um, the usage of art or image in science communication is not new, but before the advent of printing press, people used to add hand-drawn illustrations or art in their manuscripts. Uh, so the, those manuscripts were uh, restricted to some monasteries or to the court of kings or queens, but when the printing press arrived, the the printing uh, printed image became immutable mobile. The term was basically described by Bruno Latour, the famous historian of science. Uh, basically, the printed image traveled around the globe. Uh, that's how it became mobile. And the image gave some optical consistency to the reader all over the uh, globe. That's how it became immutable. So the printed image, uh, of course, uh, helped in propagation of knowledge but it also invited trade and colonization hand in hand. Next slide. Okay, so uh, this could be a perfect example of how the printed image became a tool of colonization. So you can see the image uh, at the left, left side is a image of a uh, quinine garden established in Nilgiri. So the East India Company when came to the India and the Indian subcontinent, they established many different botanical gardens with two agenda. One is botanical research, of course, to propagate the knowledge, and other one was trade. Uh, in the right, right side, you can see the image I have uh, incorporated. This, is, uh, this image is uh, uh, illustration from uh, Malabar silk cotton tree. And uh, you all know that the silk and cotton trade was the played a pivotal role in East India Company uh, economy. So uh, in this way, uh, uh, the, uh, we can say the how the trade and imperial exploitation of the botanical resources overpowered the knowledge in colonial India. So <laughs> next slide. Yeah, but uh, since the last couple of years, uh, scholars are trying to decolonize that aspect and many unknown artists from Mughal court and uh, Calcutta School of Art and uh, other school of art all around the uh, uh, subcontinent at the colonial period are emerging out and they are getting recognition and uh, getting a sense that, uh, okay, no, uh, although the East India Company and the British Empire invited many scholars and artists to the subcontinent to document natural world like flora and fauna, but Indian artists also took part and they uh, uh, gathered a handful amount of illustrations and artwork uh, for the sake of science communication. But uh, this approach is uh, absolutely necessary to honor this, this artist, but we need to remind that those artists who are patroned by uh, Mughal courts and other courts uh, like Tanjore courts um, or from the kings from the South India. But if you really want to acknowledge the decolonization aspect of art in science, especially from the subcontinent, we need to uh, tilt our lens towards the indigenous art. Next slide. Yeah, so, uh, there are uh, different kinds of tribes and indigenous people in Western part of the, uh, and the Eastern part of India, and they used to create uh, some beautiful botanical drawings which are very scientifically functional and meaningful. Here uh, for the time constant, I just used one example, uh, 
these are bandna painting uh, created by shantal tribe from purulia from west bengal state but i do live uh, their artwork the philosophy of their illustration of course they do not create this kind of artwork for the sake of science communication but uh th this kind of art or philosophical is very close to the spirit of science and uh, not related to trade or any uh other business except uh just portraying the harmony synergy and planetary and how the uh, different kind of species like insects and other species from the ground they can re remain in a synergy with the flowers and the trees so i think uh, this kind of image hold the true spirit of science and philosophy of science uh, can i show the next slide Uh, so the next slide please okay so uh, uh, if you really want to acknowledge this kind of image created by the uh, native people or the indigenous people what siddharth discussed in uh, his talk we need to create some ground or real place uh, for them so uh, to create to create such place uh, we need to replace the term history of science to history of knowledge because uh, history of science uh, the terminology itself is restricted uh, limited and not very inclusive but history of knowledge uh, i think it uh, yeah, if if you um, define the field the term history of knowledge we can accommodate other voices other kind of artworks different kind of practices from all over the globe then only uh, will be able to acknowledge artwork from the uh, indigenous people and i think uh, that approach uh, will be helpful to decolonize science and history of science uh, and the role of visual storytelling in that field so uh, so far that's it uh, we can extend this in our discussion Thank you so much, Argya. Uh, can I now call Elizabeth to share her views on this topic? Thank you so much uh, to see that and my fellow panelists who've done a very good job of preparing the ground. Um, I think really, if I was to sum up uh, the title of my brief section, it's, it's in two words, uh, three words. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why is this conversation so important? It matters because we cannot interrogate science communication and its history without driving the imperative to deconstruct the notion of science communication as a modern Western enterprise. That, that, that is patently uh, dishonest for want of a better word, it is. It's a false uh, prospectus. So we have a situation, a very problematic situation, where the current histories of science communication and its Eurocentric nodal points have served to render invisible the very long and globally diverse historical footprints of the science communication enterprise in many parts of the world particularly so in many regions of the global south. And yet we have myriad examples, as my pa uh, fellow panelists have shown already, many, myriad examples of the long-standing traditions, practices, and indigenous knowledge dissemination of many communities in the global south, who for centuries have utilized their own uniquely localized context and approaches for the communication of their knowledge and innovation assets. And yet we still persist in the insidious narratives 
of science communication as a modern development of Western European practitioners and science communicators. There is a profound need for us to demonstrate and sessions like this are critical to really debunk these uh, uh, stereotypical tropes so that we can feature and elaborate the many transcultural examples of these long-standing science communication histories and their practices, their epistemic traditions and innovations from many parts of the world. If we are to transform yet another layer of the inequalities and social cultural inclusion embedded within the onion, as I call it, of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the science communication field. So an onion, you, you, you peel all the many layers. And I really see um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in science communication as an onion with so many layers we need to peel. We have layers of gender, we have layers of race, we have layers of social class, we have layers of people with disabilities, we have layers to do with decolonization, we have yet another layer to do with uh, globally diverse histories of science communication. And it matters because the past determines the present and predicts the future. We cannot keep carrying on for centuries to be in the 21st century, and we are still elaborating science communication as a Western derived enterprise. That is a patent on truth that really undermines the global nature, the global history, the richness. It robs us of the richness of knowledge of the multiple dimensions of the empowerment and inclusiveness that would actually take the field forward. It robs us of public trust because the public do not look like us. We do not represent the public. So when we have these sort of very narrow Western Eurocentric conversations, in the many multicultural, multiracial societies across the world, we are basically telling a patent lie. We are damaging public trust because the public know different. They may not know formal science, but they know their history. So a classic example is the Benin bronzes that have been much in the news and are talked about as sort of cultural artifacts. But when you look at the history of the Benin kingdom, those bronzes were their form of communicating their science, their knowledge. They were placed around the walls of the palace. They were on public view. The public could come and view them. They even had the equivalent of what you would call uh, explainers, uh, palace explainers who would explain to, 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 to the public about the different statues, the different plaques, and the different kinds of technology, the different kinds of metal combinations, whether it's tin and bronze and tin and uh, bronze, uh, tin and uh, uh, copper that were used to make them. So, but the fact that it, it wasn't seen as what we call formal science communication, we denigrate that. And these Benin bronzes were made as long ago as the th 13th century, the time of the Viking raids. So how do we really bring the richness and the diversity of all these historical journeys, historical footprints that have taken us to where we are now to have a 21st century narrative as to how the field of science communication has arrived to where it is. And how do we then move on from here to create a much richer multi-dimension future for the field and engender greater public trust? Thank you.
Thank you so much, everyone, for beautifully setting up the stage for today's conversation and discussion. And I must mention that I really like the, the onion uh, metaphor and analogy that Elizabeth used about how difficult it is to sort of, you know, look at intersectionality and, and try to think about all the different factors that, that impact different communities and how can we engage them. So um, without any further ado, we are going to move on to our panel discussion. I'm going to kick it off by asking each panelist one single question, but I would really, really encourage everyone to send in their questions in the chat box, or you can also raise your hand and I'm going to, uh, you know, come to you in, in the order that I see it. So, okay, so let us begin by asking, so I think I, since Elizabeth spoke in the end, I'm going to ask her a question. So Elizabeth, in your experience of working at the intersection of STEM education and social justice, what are some of the factors that have led to a Eurocentric Anglophone and or heteronormative bias in the way we produce, teach and communicate science? Could you, could you share what do you think are the reasons behind such a bias? Uh, I'm not sure uh, how easy it would be to sort of uh, elaborate on the reasons. Uh, some of those are um, social, some of those are artificially engendered, uh, some of those are, are, are culturally based, but predominantly at the, at the heart of all of this, it's about power. It's about power. It's about men having power over women. It's about white Europeans feeling that they have power and superiority or they should have over people of color. It's really about power. And power is a very difficult thing for those who have it to share. And the, the privilege of power is something that is very difficult for those who have it to accept that they do and that their power is at the expense of somebody else who is less empowered. So it, it matters who does STEM. It matters that we have women engineers that look like me. It matters that we have uh, scientists from the world that look like you. Are you with me? It, it absolutely matters because it's about turning on its head the power dynamics. It's about turning on its head the privilege, the sense of entitlement. And bias, in a sense, is a form of entitlement. You, you, you get into a bias situation because you already think that I am entitled at the expense of, or I should be entitled at the expense of somebody else. So these are long-standing challenges but whichever way you slice them, when you get to the heart of the matter, it's about power and it's about who has resources and who doesn't. And until we understand it on that basis, uh, we are going to sort of be, be going round and round the houses. So then you start to talk about transformation. Transformation is about how we change the power dynamics. How do we get men to share power with women within the scientific field? How do we get uh, 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 um, people from the global north to want to share the power of the scientific space and the resources and the prestige and the status that go with it? How do we get them to share that equally with people that look like you and me? Because we are also entitled to have that access, to have that uh, knowledge, to be active in that space. History tells us that people that look like you and me have contributed to what science is today. And yet we find in the modern, so-called modern era, a hierarchy of power and racial uh, privilege that wants to deny an equal space and equal legitimacy to people that look like you and me and to women. And this is absolutely the heart of, of, of the challenge of inequality that we need to address in science, in science communication and in, in, in STEM education. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Elizabeth. Uh, would any other panelists like to take uh, a stab at this question? 
if I could just speak up, there's not much to add to this answer. But I just I just wanted to pick on something that Elizabeth said. I think it's not only a matter of you know restoring epistemic justice to those who have been excluded, you know, from science communication processes for so long or written out of its histories, but also a matter of actually writing more accurate, as Elizabeth uh, pointed out, more accurate histories of science in my case, right? Or presenting more accurate accounts of how processes of knowledge making actually work, right? They work like that in practice. And still the image that we present of it is very distorted. So it is a bit like dismantling the myth of the lonely, usually male science genius who sits alone in his laboratory. And we all know that's not how he is actually doing his work, right? But is the public sufficiently aware of that? If not, why? And what can we do to change that kind of perception? So that's the only thing I wanted to add. Thank you so much for that answer. Sure. Uh... I'll give a page. Would you like to add anything to that? I'm not sure I can add anything to that. Uh, great. Oh, I think uh, he has told everything and it's absolutely brilliant. Great. All right. So moving on to the next question. So I would like to um, direct this towards Amelia. So Amelia, in your experience of working at the historical intersection of technology, medical practice, and the public communication of science, how important do you think is incorporating local context and examples for engaging communities around scientific discourses? Uh, thank you for that question. And the short answer, it's essential, it's crucial. And I, I don't think you can do effective science communication without incorporating relatable examples from the context you are working in. And I was involved, uh, for example, in a public engagement project about uh, media and uh, technologies of communication with um, Anuja Gosalkar from uh, Drama Queen and students from um, Focus uh, High School in Hyderabad. And it was based on research I conducted on electric telegraphy and journalism in colonial India for my first monograph. And the students made a documentary theater performance around it using historical records such as um, colonial maps and photographs. And it was an amazing exercise because they took this old colonial maps of India and started to learn with them and extract information that was relevant to their own lives, right? So they started to think about distance, they started to annotate the maps, they tried to establish India's position within the system of uh, telecommunications and how communications within India and Britain and other parts of the world were in the 19th century. And it was, it was a very important experience for them because many of them hadn't actually seen those kind of maps before. And uh, they learned a lot and we learned a lot from it as well. So I think it, it's crucial. You need to have this kind of examples to which students can relate and you know, other members of the public you're working with. Right, would anyone else like to add to that? I mean, I, I could just say, yeah, to, to agree. Um, a lot of the work we're doing now that we find to be really effective uh, you know it is is communicating about science or health information let's say in covid times and and working with a very specific cultural or ethnic group and you know pulling talking to those people and pulling examples from their own questions or concerns or histories on these things and i mean it makes it they can see themselves reflected and makes them feel like you're listening to them. I mean, it, there's, there's so many wonderful aspects of it that I think it helps engagement with the content and interest, um, which is, you know, half the battle is when, you, when it comes to communicating about risk or um, health recommendations. So I think it's critical, especially if you're speaking to a group that has mistrust of the government or health authorities and you're asking them to make health decisions <laughs> where they have to have that trust. Great. Um, all right. So Paige, I would like to ask you the next question. So in your experience of working at, the, at an international science communication organization, what are some of the challenges and barriers to incorporating more multicultural, inclusive, and diverse ways of communicating science? Do you, in your experience, face any difficulties when trying to get a more diverse set of people to work together? Yeah, so I mean, one challenge, you know, um, 
at Lifeology, one thing that we are trying to do, like you said, is bring together diverse people to work on projects to communicate about science, you know, especially obviously when you're trying to communicate to a particular group. Um, we've done Lifeology courses on, you know, um, about vaccines or about clinical trials or for minorities. And there's so much there, obviously, that's um, so much history of trauma and history of things that we need to consider and communicate. And we can't do that without talking to members of those communities, obviously. Um, and one barrier that we found that a lot of, you know, scientists or healthcare providers or pharma companies that want to do this kind of communication and recruit minorities into clinical trials, for example, is that they don't even know where to start, it seems, uh, when they come to us to like, they haven't even talked to these groups yet, or maybe only in small amounts, and they're struggling to like, you know, they haven't thought about bringing in artists or storytellers from those communities to help create the content that they're, the educational content they're creating to try to recruit, recruit those participants, for example. Um, so it seems one challenge is just helping people find each other. Like it, it seems like yeah, well, a lot of what I'm doing is just playing matchmaker. So there seems some lack of matchmaking out there or, or platforms where people can meet others um, for like projects, um, especially strategically where you're looking for particular people. And so that's just one thing that we're trying to solve and we certainly haven't done it yet, but just try, just for getting a platform where people can meet each other and work in diverse groups um, is, is a start. Um, so I think there's a lot of challenges there and then also the power dynamics, right? Of like having a scientist work with an artist and trusting the artist to make decisions as opposed to saying, this is what I want you to draw for me. Uh -huh. um, creating more like equitable, you know, science art collaborations is huge and it's something that a lot of scientists don't really understand why, why they should do that and why they should let the artist dictate the storyboarding or, you know, so many things. So a lot of it is education too of like, here's why you need to collaborate with diverse groups. And this is some things you need to set up in your collaboration protocols for allowing the power dynamics to change from the scientist or person who's paying for the creation of this content to the, to you know the diverse voices or creators who can actually make it culturally relevant. Um, so I might just be throwing more questions out there, but yeah, I think that there's a range of different challenges that we can try to solve. Great, thank you so much. And I think more questions are always scared of asking questions and then pushing pushing things forward, right? And and I also wanted to add to what you said that. Creating a platform and getting people together is just the first step. There's so much more uh, mm -hmm. downstream of that, that that we need to sort of have a conversation on. Right. So before I ask the next question to Arkia, uh, I would once again remind everyone in the audience to please send us your questions. We are really looking forward to engaging with you. If you would like to ask the question yourself, please raise your hand and I will come to you very soon uh, after this question to Arkia. All right. So Arkia, in your experience of working with visual storytelling formats, what present day science, what can present day science communicators and scientists learn from the use of such diverse formats and approaches and how can it help them make their science communication more inclusive? Yeah, uh, so, uh, okay, so the impact of visual is always greater than the prose or the what is written. Uh, it's aesthetically, the impact is uh, higher, the visual. And also the language of visual is universal because of course, if I am drawing, if I suppose I am trying to communicate someone uh, who doesn't um, know English or my uh, language is Bengali, so uh, how can I communicate to them? Suppose someone from Spain. So, so visual communication is a universal language, of course. And uh, what I do is comics, uh, which is a uh, amalgamation of text and image for better communication. But also, I am trying to develop something. Uh, which is wordless, so that it could be communicated to the visuals only. Uh, but uh, I'd like to add something uh, about the problems in this process or this practice. Of course, the visual communication is important, but we right now need some uh, immediate change in the process, how to the course of history, visual science is visually communicated. Like suppose I ask someone, a kid, to draw a scientist, okay. So suppose you are telling a story about science and just draw a scientist. Um, I'm sure that uh, most of the kids will draw someone, uh, just Amelia was saying, 
imagine you are sitting in that lab just like you draw someone wearing white coat with test tube in his hand you some people most of the people do not draw some someone with color some or a, or a female sentient and the problem is not in the people is the visual communication happened so far to the magazine from the 60s 70s nobel prize and from the nobel committee how they portrayed the image the life magazine the time magazine uh, all of these magazine so the these images are important like uh, okay so these images are inside our head so when we are drawing scientists we automatically drawing some magazine okay and another one is uh, i would say uh, the visual structure in science science communication or the history of science communication need to uh, keep their mind uh, which is Uh, the portraying the uh, liberal part, like someone's not a scientist or practicing science directly. Someone is a laboratory worker, the machine man. Okay, if you go to the uh, image from the Scientific Revolution, which was published in Britain of the Royal Society, in uh, Royal Society, uh, Royal Society image, you will find most of the people who are working in the lab of the again some male genius, uh, they do not have any face. Okay. so their faces are hidden so uh, we need to acknowledge that if we are suppose we are illustrating something from laboratory science is happening there we need to draw the scientists properly and the other people the students and who are involved in machine the laboratory section of the science not the scientists so we need to keep it, i particularly try to keep this in mind when i do when i draw for scientists or i draw some stories and uh, yeah the, this is very impactful but we have to be very cautious uh, before we make an impact great great thank you so much uh, 